Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first keynote lecture session of the School of Mathematical Psychology 2022. Uh, I would like to welcome our keynote speaker today, Andrew Hetcott. Um, he's a, a conjoint uh, professor at the School of Psychology of uh, University of uh, Newcastle and a visiting professor at the Department of Psychology, University of Amsterdam. Uh, very uh, briefly, I can say uh, the current research in his uh, Amsterdam Mathematical Psychology lab uh, focuses uh, on the neural and cognitive processes underlying um, decision making and uh, value based decision making, um, inhibition, language, attention, and memory, uh, looking through the lens of uh, mathematical and computational uh, cognitive models. Uh, one of the important uh, points I would like to make uh, here is uh, Andrew is uh, uh, one of the main developers of popular accumulator models like uh, LBA, BA, Advantage, LB, and Race models. Uh, today, he wants to talk more about uh, his recent race uh, model toolbox. And uh, yeah, okay, Andrew, uh, main thank you again for accepting the invitation. So take it away, please. Excellent. Thank you very much, Joel. And um, yeah, thanks for inviting me. Uh, it looks like um, you've been, uh, you've got a great workshop going on. And I think it um, sounds like you've already covered a lot of the basics I'm going to talk about. Um, what I'm meaning to do is, I know it's probably the end of a long day where you've all been, you know, doing hard work. So what I want to do here more is sort of give you what Australians would call, oh God, someone's doing some drilling in the background, uh, a cook's tour which is a, a broad overview of sort of uh, um, different varieties of, of ways that you can uh, um, uh, make use of these, these things called race models. So what are they? Uh, I'll describe that. And then I'll sort of talk about how perhaps you, I think of them in a way that's broader than, than other people might think. Um, and so I'll try to justify why I think that um, that conceptualization gives you a nice framework to see a whole load of different models uh, as fitting within that. And so then you can start to see some similarities and differences and understand um, you know, how they go together. I should also say too, that I'm not someone who's very committed to the idea that there's one correct model. Um, all models are wrong. I mean, I know that's a, a, a truism, but it's manifestly true because you know the thing is the thing itself and a model is some sort of abstraction on there. And the big question is really how useful are those models? So. Um, you know, for various scientific purposes. And one of the reasons that um, uh, race models are useful is their tractability. And the second is their power, their ability to express broad um, or, or to do all sorts of computations. So, wait a minute, why is that not? Oh yeah, there we go. All right, so um, what is a race model? What, early on in psychology, these were called horse race models, I think due to Gordon Logan. And the idea is that you have some processes which race with each other. And as the title indicated, winner takes all, they classically, uh, whoever gets to the finish line first is going to take the prize, is going to take control of behavior is typically the way that we think about it. So here I've just got two horses racing, but a, a nice thing about this, these sort of models is that you can have as many horses racing as you want, and this can correspond to as many responses you want, not just binary choice, uh, but beyond that. And in fact, later we'll talk about cases where there are more horses racing than there are responses. Um, now, in the very simplest case where the race is independent, that is the horses don't get to, so to speak, interfere with each other during the race. So they race in independent lanes. Then the really nice thing about race models is they have very simple mathematical expressions for the time it takes for um, uh, the fastest horse to get to the finish line. And the general idea is so that you've got, you know, some time T um, and uh, um, you want to figure out what the distribution of that, that time is for a particular horse to win. So the one at the top there that's ahead. To do that, all you need to know are two things about the horses. Their um, density function, little f there, little f i t. Uh, so, you know, that's just a, 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 a distribution curve, I guess. Um, and then you need to know the survivor function, which is just the integral of the density <clears throat> or one minus the integral of the density. So one minus the CDF. So really that, that equation is super simple. It's saying, well, normally if there was no one else racing, the distribution of times for one racer to get there would be uh, little fi. 
All right. So, but what we have to do is we have to say, well, not only did this one get there, but they got there first and the other ones were survivors. They weren't there yet. They hadn't hit the... So all that's saying in words is this distribution that now made defective or made less than one because not all the time does this one win. Sometimes other ones do, but in this case, all of the other ones didn't get there first. All right, so super simple conceptual sort of idea. Now this requires independence, but you know, and that's something I'll talk about breaking and, and, and why you might wanna break that. But because of this, this very simple form, mathematically, as long as you've got the density and the cumulative density, you can easy, easily calculate likelihoods and they're the basis of um, estimation procedures. They're a sufficient statistic. They capture all of the information um, <clears throat> in your observations and your observations are just uh, usually who got there first and how long did it take them, okay? It's so quite a simple idea now that but that idea of a winner takes all really has been known for quite a while to be very computationally powerful essentially Turing equivalent all right so you can compute anything with these things these max pickers all right so you can string together circuits of these things that can end up computing any function so they so you know you're in a framework that's that's rather powerful so you've got these this sort of in the in the simplest form simplicity um, and tractability but you know that also you can build these things up and get more complicated things, um, uh, which of course, you know, is useful because we're looking at brains and they do pretty complicated stuff. Okay, so let's look at the oldest of the, uh, well, I guess in psychology, at least the oldest race model uh, was used to model something called the stop signal paradigm. So the stop signal paradigm is one that's kind of the main way of measuring your ability to inhibit responses. So the idea is you might have a, this is a go trial. So this is getting cut off by that thing at the top. I don't know how to remove it. I said, this, that says go trial. And so you're, you've got a fixation, you get some stimulus, maybe an arrow pointing to the left or right, and you press a button to the left or the right, okay? But occasionally you have a stop trial. So that goes along the same as before, but after some delay, this SSD here, uh, stop signal delay, uh, another stimulus comes up, maybe a tone sounds or maybe around the arrow, a big red box occurs. And if that happens, you've got to do your best not to press the button. Now you might be halfway through doing that, right? So you need to inhibit an ongoing response. So you play around with this SSD and set it in such a way that you may, in one, one version of this paradigm, you get about 50% success. You succeed sometimes, you fail sometimes. And what you're really interested in is kind of how in the horse race type idea, how fast this stop horse is. So imagine this is the, this is the point in the, the race at which the go horse has taken off and then some SSD, um, uh, this stop signal delay later, the stop runner gets to run. And typically the stop runner is quicker, right? There's, there's a fair bit of evidence that indicates the system subserving this response inhibition is quicker. So it will catch up, but only if it doesn't have, the, the go runner doesn't have too much of a head start. So this is Logan and Cowan's classic horse race model of the stop signal paradigm. Now, what they did was something very non-parametric here. It turns out that you can get a fair way uh, um, to estimating things like, and the key thing here is how fast is your stop horse? All right, if you're a good inhibitor, you have a quick stop horse. All right, if you're a poor inhibitor, then uh, you've got one that's not very fast. And so that's the key thing you wanna measure. now. The tough thing about that, of course, is the stop horse wins. You don't see anything. You, don't, you just see that they don't respond. You never get to directly observe the stop horse's speed. So it's entirely latent. So that means you need a model. And there's no way around this, right? And some things in psychology, sure, you don't need a model. In this case, you absolutely need one, one way or another. Now, there are non-parametric versions of this. That, well, rather, it's, a, it's always a race model. But you can have non-parametric -param estimators of the speed of this stop horse. And you get it something like its mean, mean time to run uh, under certain assumptions, like its distribution of times to run is a constant. It doesn't vary. It's always the same or that it's symmetrical. There's a few. So you've got to make some assumptions, not entirely non-parametric in reality. But this, this, this is quite popular as a, because it was a straightforward thing to do. I'll talk later about how you can take a more sophisticated approach to modeling this sort of um, stuff. So you can actually have a, a model where we start saying things about the distributions of times for the horse to run. For example, it's just not, it's obviously not the case that the, the stop runners takes exactly the same time every time. 
All right, there's, there's many tests you can make of that. And it's, it's an approximation, but it's just not true. Okay, so there's an example, one of the earliest examples of, the, uh, of a race model. Um, let's now shift on to what I think you've already talked a little bit about, which is the more traditional evidence accumulation model. So this is the idea that you make decisions by accumulating evidence. And that eventually, if you get enough evidence favoring one thing or another, you make a response corresponding to that. And you're pretty much always thinking here that the time, so you're accumulating evidence and it takes some time. How long does it take to get to that threshold? Well, it's you know high school mathematics. It's the distance you've got to go divided by the speed with which you're heading there. All right, so you've got this kind of simple way of understanding things. So I, I like simple things. And um, with my former student, Scott Brown, we came up with a very simple version of an evidence accumulation model called the linear ballistic accumulator. The idea here is that um, on every trial, you've got, uh, uh, you accumulate and you accumulate in a linear manner. But the rate at which you accumulate varies from trial to trial, okay? But what you do is you, you accumulate. So this, here we've got evidence accumulating. Here we've got decision time because essentially when it hits this thing up here, the threshold, this thing is finished. Now, this by itself could model simple response time. That is, you know, you show me a bright light and I press a button or there's a tone and I press it. There's no choice involved. To move to choice, we add another accumulator. All right, so say we've got a left and a right so each of these is a linear ballistic accumulator. It's governed by an equation like this, but we need to put some random variables in here. Um, I talked about one for the rate. So this, you know, trial to trial, this varies. So one trial, on every trial, the, it's very, very simple and therefore very tractable. And every trial, uh, within a trial, we've just got a linear increase. Um, but from trial to trial, it varies. Uh, the distance also, we, we assume to be variable. So we had a uniform distribution here on the starting point. All right starting anywhere from zero up to there. And you can see there are a couple of start point distributions. So what that does in the end is it produces a couple of, um, uh, I, I talked about those distributions of times to finish. So remember that race equation, they're defective distributions. They're distributions that have a mass under them less than one. All right, so here's the, the green one is the time for this. In this case, it's a thing with a higher rate. The arrow is pointing a bit, you know, it's steeper. And this one's flatter. And so, most often this wins, okay? And you know, they typically would respond to the, correspond to the correct response. And that, that's, the, that's that density that I talked about, F, but made defective, multiplied by the probability that no one else had got there, okay? And this will be the density for this accumulator, another F, but multiplied by the probability that this guy hasn't got there, all right? So if you took the area under here and the area under there and you added them up, it would add to one. Okay, so I hope I'm not being too simple here. You've probably done way more sophisticated stuff than this, but I thought I would start, you know, sort of revising a little bit on, on fairly simple things. So this, this is one particular um, uh, uh, evidence accumulation model. And we, we've got two accumulators here, but we could have more, we could have many of these distributions. Okay, so to just give a little more detail about this, the, a big thing about the, this style of model is that everything, all of the variability, because that's another thing to think about, right? If you give me exactly identical stimuli uh, on one trial and the next and the next, I won't respond in the same time, right? There will be a distribution of times. So where's that randomness coming from? Where's that variability coming from? There's a couple of ways you can think of that. We'll talk about one about within trial variability, but let's focus here on between trial. That just means from trial to trial, maybe your attention fluctuates a bit, all right? And that affects the rate. Maybe you've got some carryover from the last trial. Maybe so say you're subject to the gambler's fallacy. On the last trial, um, uh, you know, uh, it was a left response. So you're like, well, I think it's a 50-50 thing. So I'm a bit biased towards a right response. So maybe you start your accumulation for the right response a bit higher, all right? So that's captured in this model by this normal distribution of rates, all right, from trial to trial. So on any one trial, you pick a rate here, you pick a rate here, and start points. You pick, you pick one here, you're biased towards um, saying yes. In this case, you're biased towards saying no, all right? This is evidence up this way. This is time across this way, that time from here when you start to when you hit threshold would be decision time. But 
this, this idea actually goes back quite a way. I think that there was a book chapter in the 80s by Carpenter about this. This is probably the most prominent one. They had a similar model, but with no start point variability um, and uh, only looked at um, uh, uh, simple RT, but uh, and in, with eye movements, but here, here's the full choice model. So now what we've got is independent normal distributions for yes and no. We've got independent uniform distributions on the two accumulators and they race. And you can see an example here where uh, this one happened to start higher than that one, but it had a lower rate. But because it had a head start, it got there first. All right, so let's say the average rate was actually higher for this accumulator. This is kind of the correct one. So you've made an error, right? This one, because you randomly started with some bias, um, then uh, uh, the wrong thing has got there. But imagine if you lifted the threshold, all right, made it higher. Eventually, the higher rate of this one will overtake that one, and this one will win the race. So what you've got there is an example of what's called speed accuracy trade-off. If you give me more time, if I raise my threshold, I integrate out the noise, and consequently, I end up being more and more likely to make a correct decision. Now, that won't always be the case in this model, right? You could, because no, see, these are two normal, they are two normal distributions. I could end up sampling, unluckily, a higher value from this one up there and a lower value from that one, and then no amount of time will ever make me correct. Right, there's a bound on the speed accuracy trade-off. So this model has that intrinsic and something we always observe, right? It, it's very few decisions where if I just tell you, no, no, wait a really long time, will you always get it right? There'll st still be some problems. You typically can't integrate out all the noise. Okay, let's, oops, what we got here? All right, let's have a look at a couple of applications of these sort of models. So one is prospective memory. So this is work I did with Luke Strickland, former postdoc. Um, and uh, we were modeling something called prospective memory, which is where you, you're going along doing a routine task, say a lexical decision task. Uh, you know, is it a word, is it not a word? But then occasionally something comes up that, that means you have to make a third and different response. And this is a, a laboratory analog of you're driving home and your wife has told you to get the milk and do you remember to stop and get the milk or do you do your usual thing and just drive all the way home? All right, so it's a, that sort of task. It had always been viewed as a memory task. We modeled it more as a decision control task. It had always been modeled people just looking at the ongoing task and then saying, you know, the, over here, this lexical decision task and not actually modeling the fact that you were making a third response sometimes. So we simply put together three accumulators. And in order to capture this, we needed to build in things from Todd Braver's um, proactive and reactive control framework. Like if you do get this, PM stimulus, this prospective memory stimulus, um, then it feeds out some inhibition to the ongoing task in order to shut it down and make it more likely that you'll make the correct response. So these, these dark lines here, inhibition being fed out. You can also control things by setting your thresholds higher and lower, depending on um, trade-offs that you might have. So one, one thing, and these are all LBAs by the way, um, so one thing is, say, for example, that non-words were more common in this task, you would typically set your threshold down lower for that thing because it's more likely. If you've got a guess, you might as well guess towards the thing that's more likely to happen, right? Here you've got the, say, the perspective. So if I told you, right, if you miss this perspective memory cue, you're going to have a really bad time when you get home and you don't have that milk, you might set your threshold down low, right? So you would value getting that thing right. So we use that and we, we use that sort of model in a whole bunch of things, looking at, this was in the more laboratory paradigm. We applied it to simulated air traffic control. Um, a a lot, of, lot of work looking at uh, um, sort of high pressure um, decisions and how these sort of models can catch them. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, these complex dual task environments. And just most recently, we looked at uh, the whole, um, uh, the area of automation, you know, getting automated advice, which we're all doing so much now. And, uh, some nice results there showing that people used inhibition in a particular way that was sort of fairly nice um, for dealing with that. But there's one example of an LBA application. Let's, um, let's look at another um, sort of evidence accumulator. Now here, notice the difference is that the lines aren't straight anymore. They're fuzzy. So moment to moment, they're varying. People who um, uh, usually like these sort of models if they, because they think they're neurally plausible, well, I've never been able to understand why you would think the brain with so many neurons would 
you know, any accumulation of evidence in the brain would be anything like any individual neurons accumulation. I think it's some averaging, but, but they're, they're quite nice models, these models. So here's, here's a, an old paper I did looking at this. This thing has a nice analytic distribution, a world distribution. So often call them racing world models or racing diffusion models is no way of thinking of it. So again, you've got some nice analytics about what's going to happen with this. So you could have one of them. Here I've got no trial to trial variability. All of the variability is just in these things being noisy. Um, here's, here's a binary. So Roger Ratcliffe is going to talk to you. Um, when he ventured into trying to directly model the brain, he, he left his beloved diffusion model and, um, and, and use uh, the binary diffusion or the two barrier diffusion and use these single barrier diffusions to model how things go on because it's a little implausible that you're integrating all in one place, um, more likely, you know, sort of, I think this was frontal eye field stuff or something like that. Um, yeah, SC, sorry, superior colliculus. Um, so the idea is you've got these two noisy things. And again, you know, you, you've got this speed accuracy trade-off thing going on. So uh, you can unluckily have a fast accumulation here, even though the average is low and that might beat the other one. And again, raising your threshold will integrate that out. It becomes less and less likely that this thing will, um, uh, 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 the wrong thing will, will win. And you get nice RT distributions there. There's a nice paper recently that's, and by the way, with all of this, I've sort of, uh, why I wanted to give out the PowerPoints is this, I've given references for all this if you want to follow them up. Um, Gabe Tillman uh, is one of my former students with Scott Brown, um, went over to work with Gordon Logan and Trish and did, has done a really nice um, uh, 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 sort of polemic about, well, maybe we only need this within trial variability. We don't need the between trial variability. It's worth a read. Um, uh, these, are, these are nice and easy to use models. Um, here's an example of somewhere I, I used this recently. This is um, work with Guy Hawkins. Um, here our idea was that um, uh, um, people had, I guess people had been thinking that, well, maybe it's not all about evidence. Maybe the decision-making also has some element of caring about time. We, we tip, now, typically, speed accuracy trade-offs are, uh, are um, uh, described by moving thresholds up and down, but maybe time itself has a direct um, role in things. Now, um, to give you a good example, if, if you've been waiting and waiting and you yet haven't made a decision, you, know, not, you, ne you haven't got your evidence threshold, and um, you know that, that trial to trial things can be easier or harder. Some trials may be, in fact, this is very typical. This is where it sort of first arose um, in random dot motion tasks with monkeys. Some trials were, there was no information. It was 50-50, there was no dominant direction. So there's really no reason to keep waiting at this point, right? And you kind of, you've got information from time. Time tells me, look, if I haven't decided by now, probably this is one that's worth just giving up on and guessing. So the way that um, Mike Shadlin and people like that modeled this was to say, oh, we had collapsing bounds. We had the, the bound of this process reduces over time. Now, a couple of things about that. Um, number one, it seems like a sneaky backdoor way of entering a, a, a sense of time into the model, right? And we actually know a whole lot about time estimation. In fact, one of these, these wild diffusion processes is one of the, the best models for our ability to estimate time. And we know people are quite bad and they're variable at estimating time. They don't do a great job of it and they get more variable on it as time increases and all these things. That, so we thought, well, why don't we just say you explicitly have something that's a timing accumulator? So this races with the other ones and you set it up in such a way that if it, if it gets to its threshold, you guess. You sort of give up and say, hey, I'm going to guess. Now we tried various guessing processes here. Um, you know, random guesses, maybe informed guesses. There are a bunch of other ways of doing it. But essentially that's the very simple idea now, super tractable, right? Unlike the collapsing bounds models, you can write out the likelihood of this, you can fit it very well. So this, this paper sort of goes through um, uh, arguing that we first of all apply this to tasks where typically you wouldn't think of doing this, standard decision-making tasks. And it turned out to do a bit better than the LBA and the DDM in terms of fit, whether you believe fit's important or not, but it, it did better. Uh, in terms of uh, complexity penalized fits. Um, and we then used it to say, well, you know, what about cases where time matters? So a lot of the monkey experiments, if you really look at them, um, the monkeys have a lot of motivation to either withhold responses or time their responses effectively. Uh, so the setups, the contingencies in the experiments mean that that's 
something that's useful for them to do. And you get these weird, so typically I showed you the RT distributions with a big, big positive skew. For a lot of the monkey work, they're almost symmetrical. All right? And that, you know, is very hard for most of the models to get. This will get this because essentially what you're doing is cutting off the tail. And that's what collapsing bounds will also do. So we showed that we could, we could do that. We could also handle interrogation or time controlled paradigms where you're just given a signal to respond. And, and you know, we use this as a, a noisy way of measuring that. Um, and then we literally linked people's time estimation ability to their decision-making ability. So very simple idea, but was able to unify some, some you know, broad literatures. So there's a, another application. Here's a, um, oh, I got these in the wrong order. Oh, um, apologies. This was meant to be an LBA application. Um, uh, so this was one where the LBA, the nice thing about it is super tractable and super quick to simulate, right? Because you literally just draw a normal from a normal and you draw from a uniform and off you go. Uh, so here we uh, modeled the idea, this was a task in which part way through, so say it was a random dot motion task and things were moving to the left. And then halfway through, we just flipped it to the right, these changing stimuli. And we, we, you can't get an analytic for this, um, but we could, because we could simulate it so fast, we used something, I don't know if you guys are gonna look at it, but the PDA or probability density approximation, it's essentially simulate lots of trials, fit a density estimator to it, use the height of that density estimator as an estimate of the, the, the likelihood, all right? So you get it likelihood that way. Um, Interesting, what we found here was that when we estimated this model, it turned out that there was a big delay between when the actual change happened. And so the model here allowed, see that the rate changes, right? So you would think it changed, it turns out there's a big delay before it changes. The stimulus changes here. Uh, we didn't, our, our measurement said we got this big three, 400 millisecond delay before the system actually picked up, oh, there's been a change. And I'll le leave you to read the paper about this, but um, uh, I mean, it, we got it in random dot motion, but you also get it in, in spatial integration like numeracy tasks. So this is a, a bit William James's moment of perception sort of stuff. Um, yeah, anyway, the, I, I can't go into too much detail about that. A more recent version of this sort of approach with, uh, again, with Jennifer Trueblood and, um, and uh, Bill Holmes and Nathan Evans um, coming in, new, new former student. Um, uh, looks at uh, uh, doing this in a, a, a diffusion decision model or a DDM framework. So this is where you have, uh, instead of racing accumulators, and by the way, this is one of, several, you know, more than, uh, this is one accumulator, that's the other. This graphic is sort of putting together two, two accumulators racing. And that, yeah, sorry, I didn't explain this well, right? So this changes, this one slows down, this one speeds up. You also get a bit of hysteresis. It doesn't go the other way or doesn't slow as much as it should. Um, uh, in this paper, we uh, looked at um, um, essentially that sort of uh, uh, changing, but we also put it into a diffusion model and we, and we allowed for some leakage. This is non-linear accumulation where you lose some information. So just wanted to have a look at as a comparison between uh, these different approaches. Um, now, speaking of um, that uh, uh, two-sided diffusion, which I gather you guys have already looked at, uh, this is, this is the, the granddaddy model, I guess. Um, uh, the idea that, and, and it's not typically looked at as a race, all right? So the idea is that you have um, two barriers now. You start somewhere in the middle. Where you start might be, you know, more towards one barrier or another or threshold. So that could be a bias. And off you go and you've got noisy accumulation, okay? And there's um, the red and the green here just indicate trials that ended up at the bottom, at the top, but, but you know, they just, and, and I, on average, you could, so the like, like the wild I showed you before, but now you, it's, you can terminate not only going up, but going down, all right? So this model was originally um, proposed uh, back in 1960 by Stone, and he pointed out the, and I guess I gather from what Jamal said, you might've uh, looked at the link between this and optimal decision-making, optimal integration of information. Um, and so this, this is a, a, an old idea that maybe humans do this, do something like this optimal integration. Now, it's a race model in the sense that you can get exactly the same behavior out of two racing accumulators that are perfectly negatively correlated. So I don't know if the term translates, but a tug of war, right? To the degree that you move in one direction, you move, you move away from the other direction. So you have this oscillation between the two directions, all right? So it ends up making the process one dimensional. 
but you get exactly the same thing out of two racing accumulators that are perfectly negatively correlated. Um, and here are this, again, these sort of characteristic um, positively skewed uh, distributions. You get out of this, um, you know, out of this infinitesimal Gaussian noise is a typical assumption we have on this. Now that model just fails, right? That, that model is known to be wrong because it has this weird property. You wouldn't think this, right? But you look at, see these red things here and these green ones? If you simulated this, I should actually, all these pictures with the red and the green, I've got some R code I could throw to you. I mean, it, maybe you guys are already doing it, but they'll simulate the pictures and you can play with it. A really non-intuitive thing about this, this model, we'll call it the, um, uh, the non the Wiener diffusion model, I think is a good way, because it's, it's different from what we would typically call the diffusion decision model. Um, the, a really non-intuitive characteristic of this is that the, these two distributions are identical not in height, they, they, they're equal up to a multiply, all right? So they're identical in distribution. What that means is the mean time to make an error and a correct response is identical. The variance of a correct and an error is identical. The skew of a, a correct and an error response is identical. And that just never happens or very rarely, right? There's a systematic known relationship between the speed of errors and corrects. If you're running an experiment collecting RT and your errors are faster than your corrects, your, your, your participants aren't very good. They're blowing it off. Um, if it's slower than corrects, it means they're trying. Right? And I'll just, I'll show you how that, now we can, we can change this model, but so th this is a fundamental failing. This is an optimal model in many ways. It's the best way you could accrue information, but it's just not what people do. But maybe it's close and can be useful at times. Um, one thing, I don't know if you guys, are you guys covering it easy? The easy diffusion? There's a, there's a nice analytic moment solution to this model. All right, so you can just literally get the probability of correct, the mean RT for a correct response and the, and the standard deviation of the correct response. And you can solve for the, the threshold gap here, A, eh? the mean rate of accumulation. Um, and uh, you've got to assume unbiasedness for the, the simplest version of this and non-decision time. Um, I, I forgot to mention that before, but I will mention that in the next slide. Uh, the time that's not taken up in making a decision, you've got to perceive the stimulus, and encode it in a sensory manner. And then once you make the decision, you have to press a button. Okay, so this thing called easy diffusion, which is E.J. Wagenmacher's term, um, and, and probably don't mention it to Roger or he'll get grumpy because he doesn't he'd like it because you know he's got a much better version in some sense, but this has nice estimation properties and can work quite well in certain cases, but it has a nice moment solution. De you know, it takes you a, a millisecond in Excel to estimate. Um, all right, so, Trouble is it doesn't work. So here's the full, what we would typically call these days, the diffusion decision model, all right? Here's a paper that, that calls it that. There's a turf war over this, right? Because what happened was this was, this is really Roger Ratcliffe's baby uh, from about 78 onwards, where he added, the first thing he added was that, remember that trial to trial variability in the LBA? He added that, that trial to trial rate variability, put that in, and that gives you slow errors. And then a little while later, neuroscience kind of came along and started using something like it and called it the diffusion, uh, wait a minute, what are they called? The drift diffusion model. And so the mathematical psychologist is like, why are you saying the same thing twice? Drift and diffusion. It's kind of like saying diffusion diffusion model. Well, that was at least what happened. So, so the, but, they, but the term DDM took off. And so uh, I think Phil Smith, are you also, you've got such a great line Phil Smith will talk a lot about that. Uh, talk, talk about these models and, and Phil and Roger decided it should be the diffusion decision model. So, but this model, if I think of the diffusion decision model, I think of it as not the, the Wiener diffusion. It adds a whole bunch of extra stuff. First of all, is this normal distribution of drift rates, of mean drift rates. So trial to trial, you've got a different mean. Within a trial, you've got this variability. So this is a very poorly drawn moment to moment variability. This, this thing is actually as is infinitesimal, has infinite variance, et cetera. Anyway, so you've got, so you've got first of all, you've got, a, uh, this, this, you've got parameters here for the mean rate and the standard deviation of rates, all right? So just like in the LBA, you have the same parameters. Um, you've also got um, random biases. So you might start at, without loss of generality, you can talk about this start, having the bottom threshold is zero and the top one is A. So this distance between the two is kind of how cautious you are. Z, if it's at A on two, means you're, on, you're unbiased, you're starting in the middle, but you have this idea of random biases. 
I think this actually was Donald Lamming who came up with this in his PhD thesis back in 68. And I think truth to be told, I think he also had the other trial to trial variability difference here, but I think Roger's most known for it. So this uniform distribution here, which is convenient because you don't go outside of the thresholds. So you draw from that as well. So you've got extra parameters here for Z and the width of it as Z. Um, and then to specify the full model, I think this was about 2002 when Francis Turlinx was working with Roger. Uh, they added in also, so that we've got this time to encode, then there's some time to make a decision, and then there's a the time to press a button. So these two times, if you put them together, we call them non-decision time. These models don't identify them separately. You would need some other information to do that. And so they added the idea that this non-decision time, this TER, is a uniform distribution between, uh, you know, with width ST and, and mean TER. Uh, you could also do this with the WOLD. You could also do this with the um, LBA. I've done that on occasion. It's typically not needed to get good fits. And the super fastness of the LBA and the WOLD goes away then because you've got to do a numerical integration. The great thing about the, the, diffusion, the drift diffusion model is that people like Einstein worked on the math of it, or maybe it was his wife and he took the credit, but that's a different story. Um, so uh, the, a lot of stuff is solved and there's some excellent um, software around from the Voss brothers uh, to the fast DM software, some C code, which we have in a package called RT, um, RT Dists. Um, which, which means that you can solve this. It turns out you can solve the likelihood for the basic model and trial to trial variability in rates. You've got a numerical integration for this one. You've got to do another numerical integration for this one. So you're in two dimensions and life gets pretty horrible in you know, anything past one day integration, uh, but it's nice software. So you know, it, it's very usable and you can estimate this model pretty well. All right, um, I should, Mention here too another one that you guys have already talked about. So kind of halfway, what you can see is that like the 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 DDM is this completely strong negative correlation between two accumulators, and it's fundamentally limited to two choice. It can't easily go beyond. But something like the uh, Usher, uh, Maris Usher, and and, and uh, James McClellan's leaky competing accumulator has something in between, um, a sort of neurally inspired idea that you've got. You, now you've got racing things going on, but they're not independent races. They compete with each other. And that competition drives a negative correlation between them. So, you know, if it's very, very strong, you end up with something that's very like the DDM. And if it's somewhere in between, then you end up with something that's a bit different. And then if it's absent, you've got independent accumulators and it has extra things like self-excitation, other stuff like that. So that's the, uh, and leakage, so the integration, is more like an ornstein ullenbach process underlying it. Um, it. It loses information, doesn't integrate linearly. Everything I talked about, the world, the LBA, the DDM, they've all been linear integrators, right? So they, they're lossless integrators. They don't forget the past. Um, and uh, um, so that's what the leakage does. The self-excitation can mean the past dominates you. And so essentially you get a rich gets richer phenomenon where if one gets ahead, it crushes everyone else and excites itself and takes off and it doesn't care what the input is anymore. It becomes a memory rather than a decision process. Um, so this, that, this, this um, stochastic DE encapsulates what's going on there where you've got these inhibitory terms and leakage terms and things like that. Uh, they also added in this idea that for neural plausibility, they said a lower bound. Um, a caution, the, this model is, is nice, but it, it, parameter recovery fails for it in the, in the full version. So this is a worthwhile paper, Stephen Miltek, uh, Brandon Turner. Uh, Brand, Brandon's used it a bunch of times since then and can get it to work reasonably well, not with full Bayesian estimation, but often with, with maximum a posteriori. If you restrict it, you can make, get it to work, but the full model, you can't parameter recover, I guess. Is that term something people will know? It means that if you simulated data from the true model and then you tried to fit it, you wouldn't get the true values back. All right, and so then you can't, if you can't parameter recover, it means that you can't interpret the parameters of a model. You could still possibly use it. You could see, well, how well does it fit and compare that to the fit of something else. But it just means be careful about interpreting perhaps. And also it's just really hard to, to, to estimate. It gives you problems. All right, um, flipping back into this, I, you know, I, I like to draw these lessons about hard to estimate. So in the stop signal paradigm, that one I talked about before, that actually ends up, um, uh, this paper uh, 
um, Gordon and, and, and um, EJ and others uh, tried to use racing worlds where the stop accumulator, the stop horse was a racing world. And in this paper, um, we showed that that model's uh, not identifiable. Um, and uh, um, we've instead used models in which instead of, so they're race models, but we don't use evidence accumulation. We use something called the ex-Gaussian distribution and that's thoroughly identifiable. And um, if, you, if you're interested, you can go and have a look at this, this, um, this paper where we've combined the two. We've combined together uh, Wolds for the choice, which has all sorts of advantages, like you can set thresholds and rates in ways that make sense uh, because we know how thresholds change under what manipulations, but also uses this X Gaussian, this descriptive thing for the go for the stop racer. And that is identified. You can use the parameters and we use it here to do a bunch of stuff. It looks kind of like this. So you've got the diffusion there and then you've got this X Gaussian distribution and you can use the straightforward race equations that you, you need an integrate in this stop signal um, context because of it when you're talking about the stop because you don't see where it finishes. So you integrate across all times that it could finish. And just for the mathy people amongst you, this is a cool paper to have a look at. So it turns out that the reason this thing fails um, is because uh, these distributions that we're dealing with all have parameter dependent lower bounds. Their supports depend on parameters. And it turns out that all of the stuff you know about maximum likelihood being optimal just fails in that case. They, these are irregular things. Now, most of the time it doesn't matter, all right? So the, basically what this old paper shows and a few others shows is that the maximum likelihood estimate is that the shift of the distribution, the lower bound is equal to the minimum, minimum observed RT. And if that's, a, that's clearly wrong, right? I mean, it's just, you know, that's a horrible estimator, the minimum, and it's just clearly wrong, uh, but that's the maximum likelihood estimate. So it's because of the irregularity. Normally that's okay. For most of our models, you never get there. There's no path into that minimum. And so this, you don't sample there, you don't estimate there. But in this case, because you don't see one of the, um, the, the responses, it turns out that it becomes a huge problem and, and the, the estimation is horrible. And, and badly wrong and doesn't converge in a ba you know, the Bayesian stuff doesn't converge. So you can see, we talk about all that there. So identifiability, very important to know about these models. Um, all right, let's, let's now go beyond binary choice and start talking about choosing between more than two things. And this is a great paper where um, Maris Usher and, and Terescu Andre um, pointed out that, hey, race models can't work in certain situations. They have this property that Rab pointed out where as you have more choices, uh, they should get faster, but people don't do that. They get slower, Hick's law. And also um, this is a nice demonstration where you actually get slower if you've got a near competitor. So say these are four brightnesses and you have to choose the brightest one. Now here, this, the average brightness of these is the same if you average out all those numbers, but you're slower here because this 0.3 competes with this 0.4. And a race straight independent race model just won't get that. Um, so um, with Don Van Ravenswey and Scott and Tony Marley, I came up with an independent race model that did, and this is called the ALBA. So here the idea is that you make pairwise comparisons between all of the possibilities. Here's a three choice one. So you've got three choices. You've got one accumulator that takes the evidence for one, subtracts the evidence for two. And this one that subtracts the evidence for one from three, and you do all of the pairs in all of the directions. And you don't make a choice. Now we've got more accumulators than choices, only three choices. But you now build in a choice rule that says, well, I need two things to finish before I decide. So effectively, it's like having a counter up here. So if you're going to decide one, both of the advantages for one, one over two and one over three need to finish. And if they finish first, you get, you know, you decide one. So this thing is completely tractable. It's just a race model. It's easy to write out the likelihoods of these combination decision rules. It can handle this nearest competitor phenomenon. It can handle Higgs law. In fact, it naturally gives Higgs law. It turns out that there's, you can have a look in the paper, but it turns out that for any random variable, pretty much you get a log increase out of this because what you're essentially doing is you're taking the min of these pairs of the max within pairs. So this min of maxes gives you a log, log increase. Um, we applied that a bit more broadly to reinforcement learning. So I think you guys are gonna do this later on. Um, this is uh, work with Stephen Militech. Um, a key thing here, so we compared the DDM. This was with learning, now, now not perceptual like brightness, but now learning qualitative, um, uh, oh, sorry, learning values, cues. And we had a simple um, model free learning rule for that. And we looked at something like a DDM doing that. 
racing independent diffusions. And here's the, the advantage, what we call the advantage racing diffusion. Could have done with this with LBAs, it works about the same. Uh, the key thing here is though, and this is how you generalize out to more than two choices. You say that my rate of accumulation here is some measure of kind of your overall speed. You might call it urgency. Stephen wanted to do that because he has a um, neuroscience background. I would, I would call it just processing speed. And then you take the difference between the two options and you give that difference a weight. And that's typically about 10 times this way for the sum. Now, the nice thing about that setup is it generalizes out to any number of things. And it also captures another important phenomena. You don't just, you're not just controlled by differences. If you have um, uh, uh, two choices which have equal differences, but different magnitudes of the two choices, there'll be differences between them. Um, in value-based stuff, you'll, you'll decide more quickly if the magnitudes are higher, even though the differences are the same. So something that purely uses differences as a problem. Although maybe Roger will talk about his tweak on the diffusion model where if you make the variability here, I think it was his trial to trial variability, proportional to the mean, then you can start getting these magnitude effects. Okay, but regardless, we were able, we, we compared these three models and this, this one with this Delta rule reinforcement learning did better than these guys. And then we were able to, the reviewers said, that's not, so, not enough, you need to do something new. And so we then went to three choice, which of course you can't go to with the diffusion for the DDM. And we also used the ALBA full sort of architecture and we could also get magnitude effects. So all of those things could be got within the one framework. All right, um, I'm, I'm probably have talked on a little bit, guys. What, are, what When am I supposed to finish? How long have I gotten to? Um, I think you have no um, time limit. We have no time limit and you can continue. But I'm probably between you and, and relaxing. So I will try to definitely finish in another 10 or so minutes. To, and I want to hear questions as well. So, um, but yeah, sorry, it's kind of, it's such a luxury to have this much time to talk. You know, usually it's a 10 minute talk. And so yeah, all right. Uh, and as you can see, like these, these, there's a lot of ways you can apply these things, right? They're really flexible toolbox. So let's, let's talk about another way of going to more than two choices, but with only two accumulators. Right, cool. So this goes back to Doug Vickers' idea of, and he used this in um, uh, modeling confidence of the balance of evidence. This idea that um, you've got two racing accumulators here, I'm showing an LBA sort of race. And that there's a bit of extra information when this one finishes, which is how far is the loser behind? But right? if the loser's a long way behind, you should be pretty sure about things. If the loser's almost at the finish line, then you might be a bit doubtful. So there's kind of extra information that's, that's running around in this model because it's two dimensional, right? It's not, one, it's not a one dimensional like a, a DDM. So what we did was we said, well, the, the trouble here is how do you read out this information? So we said, well, maybe you can read it out with extra thresholds. So let's put in an extra threshold here. Now, it's the top threshold that gets you to terminate your choice. But once you've terminated, then if you're below the, that middle threshold, you have high confidence. And if you're above it in the, in the loser, then you have, higher, you have low confidence, all right? So that's, that's a very basic idea as a kind of a readout mechanism. So what you know is the state relative threshold, not the actual bound. Uh, in modeling confidence, knowing the actual balance of evidence turns out to be problematic and not fit with a bunch of empirical phenomena. And that's not the case when you do things this way. So we called this a multiple threshold race. And um, here we used it to model not choosing. So you don't, you don't, um, you've got really a mapping rule at the end of this, right? So you say, what do I do if this one's one and this one's here versus there? So here's a case where you had three choices. You could either decide, you know, left or right, let's say, but you could also say, yeah, I'm not sure. So what we did was we mapped both of these kind of low confidence states into being not sure, saying, I don't know, right? So we could model equivocation. So this paper is all about data sets where deciding not to choose is modeled by this idea, this simple idea of just one extra threshold and mapping these two states into saying, I'm not sure. Um, I can't, I, you might, you might be able to, well, maybe you can't, but you might, I like simplicity. I like things that are tractable and simple. And so um, we, Scott and I made the claim that the LBA was the simplest model, and I think we were wrong. There's something even simpler called the, the log normal race. Um, so remember that, that equation about time is distance on rate, all right? Now, 
this gets a bit hairy to solve if you've got something like the distance is a uniform, just shifted uniform in the LBA and the bottom is a normal. It actually turns out you can solve a whole bunch of them because that's formally equivalent to the problem of figuring out the mean of a truncated distribution. And so a bunch of good statisticians have solved that for a whole bunch. Of, so we've got a paper showing you can do it for uniform and gamma and uniform and weibull, but, but even simpler is the log normal because it's reproductive under the division and multiplication. So if the distance is a log normal distribution and the rate is a log normal distribution, then the time is a log normal distribution. Super simple, super, super simple. The, the thing is though, your ability to identify rates and thresholds as separate kind of goes away. All right, they're not, they're not found, the model doesn't give it. You could do some selective influence experiments like psychometricians have been doing for years to figure it out, but it goes away. You don't, but it's, that also means it's su super simple mathematically and it, it doesn't have uh, the charming, uh, this is what the mathematical biologists would call our models, uh, these models, sloppy models, right? They have highly correlated posteriors and that's what makes them hard to sample and hard to estimate. A lot of the sloppiness goes away because of this, this thing disappearing here. Anyway, we talked about signal detection theory. Turns out if you build with the LNR, one of these multiple threshold races, you get back unequal variance Gaussian signal detection theory as a special case. So now you have dynamic unequal variance signal detection, Gaussian signal detection theory. So you have both time and you have, um, you know, this highly, highly, the most successful model in mathematical psychology, right? So this idea that you put thresholds across Gaussian distributions and the, your probability to responding is the area under the different distributions between these things. That turns out um, in this paper we showed is formally uh, just a subcase, but we actually figured out that you needed correlation here to fit the data there. So what, what do I mean by this? This isn't the same correlation as in the LCA, uh, that, that moment to moment correlation. It's rather trial to trial correlation. So this is kind of, if you plotted, this is kind of a measure of the balance of evidence or confidence and RT. You typically see this, that if you're highly confident, you're fast. And if you're lower confidence, then you're slow. And that's what the independent version of this model gives. But it turns out that if you describe the distance and the rate by some multivariate normal and you had correlations, and then you can just pump it through this equation, you end up just getting uh, an analytic solution for this. So you've got an analytic solution for a correlated race model where the correlation is trial to trial correlations. Okay, so this is, you know, your threshold and your rate, trial to trial, vary according to, and blah, 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 you get this. So super tractable. Um, and so we fit that and you can get these. So you, it's quite an intuitive pattern, really. If you've got a very strong negative correlation, the balance of evidence is very indicative of what's going on. And you get this strong uh, effect of RT, much stronger than over here. And if it's um, uh, positively correlated, then all of the noise is noise that's simultaneously affecting both accumulators. They're both going up and down together. And so the difference doesn't tell you much about anything in terms of confidence. So, so you get this no, you don't get this difference. So anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a fun model. Um, we got a paper that's, that's doing the rounds at the moment where we do the same thing with the LBA and we think that's maybe better because it helps identify thresholds and rates, but it requires a numerical integrate, um, only one dimensional, and that makes it a bit slower to, to work with. Um, John Wickstead is a big fan of this because he loves, loves signal detection theory. So, um, all right, I'll finish up now, last bit here. Um, uh, these sort of race models, and, and I think Phil Smith will talk much more about this, uh, but not as a race model, but, but here's, a, here's an alternative way of thinking about it, to do continuous responding. This is where you don't just choose yes or no, or three or four or eight, You've got, you're, you're marking a line. How long is this line? You're marking how long it is or, you know, what color matches, you know, and you've got the color circle, you know, that sort of thing. So Peter Vaughan came up with this great way. This, this is an awesome paper, won, won the, the prize um, which I, uh, for, for the best paper in JMP, which I like because I put it up for it because I loved it so much. So his idea was that you can, you can formally think of these race models as um, a, a two-dimensional space where you've got the right evidence total and the left evidence total, right? And then you're just moving around in this space. And so the MTR looks kind of like this, the multiple threshold race, right? Um, he, you know, this is again an LBA, but you could have a, a, a you know, a world or whatever. Um, so here I am going through one threshold, two thresholds, three thresholds, I'm there, right? So I decide high confidence left, all right? 
over there, I'm going through three thresholds, right? It's a super simple idea, okay? But wait, there's more. This is like the set of steak knives. Um, you could, when, when the, Peter, um, uh, when he came and visited me on a fellowship when I used to work in, in Australia, um, I explained this model to him and he heard this model. Um, and so then, and then eventually we figured out there were two different models and they were both kind of cool. So in this one, you're, you're, you're sticking this, uh, to this idea of winner, right? This, you've, got to, you've got to go through the top threshold to win. Here you don't. You just say, I've got to go through three thresholds. I don't need to go to the top one. So here, what we're going to do is we're going to decide we go through one of those and one of those, but then we go through this. The other guy hits a threshold. So in total, we've gone through three thresholds. Here we go through three, right? And we're high confidence there. Here we've got low, et cetera, right? Do you get the idea that you can, you can just, it's, we call it the threshold counting model, all right? And it kind of a bit rational in some ways because, you know, if at this point you've gone through two there and you get another one, you could say, hey, yeah, it, I, I probably shouldn't be all that confident. So we haven't done this yet. We think this would be good in a kind of game show scenario. You know, where you've got a question and it's like, should I pass or should I go on? You know, um, do I know this question? No, oh, no, I don't think I do, but I've only got a limited amount of time. So I want to give up on that one and go on. I think this one's going to be more optimal for that. But even better, um, th this one had linear boundaries. Imagine you had qu qu quadratic boundaries. So my spacing is quadratic. And now imagine I had lots of them. Hey, I've got a circle. Right? Or imagine that really what I'm doing is now if we set the thresholds and approximation, really what I'm doing is my, I'm sharing the swells here. I'm, I'm deciding when to stop, not based on one, but both. Say I stop on the square root of the X and the Y position squared um, being some number. Well, this is, a, the, is like the circular diffusion, right? This is this idea that you stop on the bound of a circle, right? But within a, a deterministic model, and you can see now that the unity I was talking about, the continuity of this thing back to the MTR and to the races all the way through to this sort of thing. So to finish up, Peter and I have got a paper that's, that's, that's doing the rounds at the moment. You can see it on Psych Archive where we had people doing things like a, a, um, a, a reproducing a line length. So, you, so in practice, you, would, you, would have, you could move it here, this cool MATLAB where you moved around the thing and you can make these two red and blue dots line up. And then once you learned how to do it, you got them this far apart and you had to move the mouse over here and cross the boundary to say, how long is this? All right. And what we said was, hey, could we do discrete and continuous with exactly the same model? Do we need a different model? So we gave you a task. Either you were doing one, two, three, or you were just doing continuous response. Okay. And we set that up as a, as a race for short and long on the quarter circle. And it worked very nicely. And then we did it for a color task. So here, what you've got is, you know, you've got different colored dots in there. We might have just two different colors of dots or five or, eight. well, actually, I forget the details of the experiment. I think there were more than that, but you only had, you know, only had a certain number of choices that you could make, okay? Um, and, or you could have a continuum. And you, so, so here you've got two choices, either there or there. Here you've got five, here you've got eight, you've got the continuum. And we modeled this with a three-dimensional version of this thing. Now, I should point out too, this model is an analytic, but it's an LBA-based model, so it's super quick. So you can just simulate from it and you can do PDA, which is what we did to. Um, so we just have a, like the trichromatic theory of color vision, we've just got three accumulators that are accumulating three, you know, the three primaries. And you get all sorts of nice things out, like you get these, these modes in between, which correspond to the, you know, lots of nice perceptual phenomena come out of this. So have, have a look at that. Anyway, I'm really pushing it now. What I've got a minute. So I just want to finish off by saying, you've got to estimate all these things. It's great that you guys are doing Bayes. They're tough to estimate uh, because of these, the sloppiness, the posterior correlations. So I've been using for a while this method. This is um, uh, differential evolution MCMC. Um, it, you know, things like JAGs uh, and wind bugs just don't work with these models, all right? Don't try it unless they're super simple, like the, 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 the um, uh, you know, the very simple diffusions. Um, stands okay, but it's a bit slow, uh, but you can get it to work. Um, uh, this differential edition MCMC is not bad, very good in individual fits, not so good in hierarchical stuff. I got a whole bunch of R functions that make this all easy for you to do. Um, but recently, um, Scott and Guy, um, Scott Brown and Guy Hawkins and then a bunch of smart um, 
Matthew types, David Gunawan have got a new sampler, which I'm very excited about. So this is a particle metropolis within Gibbs at the hyper level, and it seems to be much better at dealing with hierarchical models, which is, of course, is the big reason you want to do Bayes. So it's very cool. I've just started playing with that um, and implementing it. And of course, and I gather this is something that um, Jamal, as well, you're one of your students who may even be here, is playing with his Bayes flow, um, which is just essentially uh, using uh, deep neural networks to, to approximate these things. Now, it won't help you with identifiability, but it can help you eventually with speed and also can help you with models untractable. I mean, nature doesn't have to be tractable, right? And so it's nice to have this as well, but I think it's maybe nice to go between these two. Another big thing about this one is it deals with correlated hypers. So you can do full correlation and um, some work that, that we're doing here and we'll talk about hopefully um, at this um, summer school, which we're running um, in August, uh, which is model-based neuroscience. We've been running this for years, a bit of forcement. Um, uh, we may be get, well, we've may we always taught this. We may, depending on how well the implementation goes, go to this. Uh, so here's a link for you if you're interested. We've got um, uh, Peter Dyan, Michael's there, uh, Raffle Bogarts, um, myself, Brandon, a um, bunch of good speakers. And it's a very practically oriented workshop. So it's really about how to fit these models. Um, so yeah, um, please contact us if you're interested in that and I will finish there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Many thanks uh, for your great presentation. It was very interesting for me. Yeah, um, uh, okay, everyone, uh, any questions? Yeah, Amir. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, nice presentation, uh, Professor. Uh, I have very questions, but uh, at first, uh, uh, I want to ask a, a question about uh, advantage race diffusion model. Uh, if you go to uh, the uh, drift uh, mapping function that you have used, uh, it's a linear combination between the uh, difference and summation of two inputs. And uh, uh, the point is that when we use uh, some, uh, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, Bayesian estimation or uh, maximum likelihood, uh, the, uh, mm, the summation uh, coefficient and the difference coefficient uh, are not uh, under our control. So the uh, drift uh, value can be negative. For, for example, the unchosen, uh, uh, the unchosen options can be negative, but mm -hmm. it, is, uh, uh, it is not consistent with the theory of the, uh, uh, with the uh, uh, principles of the racing accumulator models. And um, well, because sure. because it's negative, so, but uh, so uh, the L for, the LBA is totally fine to have negative rates, right? There's no problem whatsoever. Negative rates work. The, it's only the 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 analytics of the world that are uh, tough with negative rates. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I, but in the uh, but if you're doing uh, the advantage racing diffusion, I agree. Then you can end up getting into it. So you're going to have to play around with bounding priors and things like that. Um, mm. So that that would be the way that you would you would solve that. I guess you could reparameterize, and that would make some of those effects multiplicative. And we hadn't played with. To be honest, this was kind of the simplest. I wanted to be as simple as possible. Uh, mm. That was the aim with this thing, right? Simple and and easy to identify. Um, Interesting sideline on this, we've now, so in, in that paper, what we did was we uh, knew the brightness values. Yeah. We've now figured out that we can estimate the values. We don't need to know them. We can recover them from data. Um, you've got to have the right priors and the right setup. We're just exploring that, but you can get that back. Uh, but yes, I, I agree in entirely with you, Amir, that um, uh, you could go outside the allowable um, space for a world in terms of getting negative rates, mm. um, and you would have to you would have to bound your prior somehow, and or you'd have to use the prior to bound that so that it got rejected if it went into that region. But uh, uh, as far as uh, uh, I've worked with uh, this model, 
actually working with uh, uh, actually uh, doing some uh, uh, assuming some uh, constraint uh, on the parameter makes uh, the fitting procedure very complex and it's it's a bit uh, hard actually uh, at least for me yeah but, no 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 uh, I'd imagine it would be that would be so I'd have to think about how I could reparameterize. I mean, the easiest thing to do is to stick everything on a log scale, right? And then you get positivity guaranteed, but then those equations end up being equations mm. about multiplying rather than they do about, right? So you change the semantics of things, but that would definitely keep you on the, on the you know, you keep you on the positives, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah. But you've Thank run you. in, in, in your fitting, you've just run into this problem that it's gone negative. And um, yeah, okay. Now that's a practical. We haven't, we didn't run into that. Uh, or at least Stephen didn't say he ran, he ran into that with fitting the the value based stuff. And I'm mm -hmm. not entirely sure why that would be, but I totally agree that could be an issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I have um, many other questions. If uh, the other one have a question, let's uh, turn and uh, then I ask my questions. If okay. no one asks, I can continue. Okay, so Arsha, Arash, Arash, Arash. Okay, you get it right. Uh, first of all, thank you for your uh, excellent presentation. I really learned a lot. Um, I want to ask about, um, uh, sorry, multiple threshold race. So we, in this kind of uh, model, we have something to account for confidence and we can uh, model not choosing, um, but, it's just the idea I want to know, do we have a me me mechanism to uh, some kind of terminate the process, uh, decision process with confidence? Just an example. For example, in lexical decision task, uh, we have some low frequency work. I'm not sure, I'm not saying that, that this will happen, but I think uh, for some uh, low frequency work, we have some kind of false confidence, uh, maybe, he mistake the uh, low frequency word with some high frequency word and to, he terminate the decision process sooner. It can be um, implement something like this with multiple trace, uh, multiple threshold rates. Uh, so I want not, to yeah. terminate the, the sorry. You want to terminate based on some measure of confidence? Yes. Yeah, right. So maybe with uh, threshold counting, because I mean, the, the multiple threshold race is kind of limited in that it's always going to terminate on the top boundary. So it's really a classic, you know, racing model. Um, as soon as you move to things like threshold counting or the geometric model, then indeed, yes, you can start thinking that what you're doing. So how would that work? Say, or you could even think of metrics on like the difference between. So say, you know, if you've got a low you know, you've got one thing, you know, you've got one boundary crossed, then another one's crossed uh, for the other accumulator. Well, now you kind of know it's, it's going to be a tough choice, right? Because they're, they're running neck and neck with each other. So you may be able to get that in some sort of threshold counting sort of structure. I don't think you'd get it straight out of the MTR. Because um, that termination decision is like, it, it went back to Doug Vickers' old idea that it was just a standard race and the termination and the termination was he never considered termination as anything to do with the balance of evidence. And I think that's what you're saying. You want this process to stop as a function of the balance of evidence. That's got to be something like the threshold counting model or the geometric model. Mm -hmm. So have a look at those as options for you there. Thank you very much. No problem. Good luck with it. Uh, Amin? Uh... Hello, thank you so much uh, for your valuable presentation. Uh, I have a general uh, question. Um, as you know, uh, DDM and evidence uh, accumulation has been used for a lot of uh, cognition process. For example, memory, perceptual decision making, and also reinforcement learning and you said uh, is also be used for uh, a stop signal inhibitory control. Uh, my question is that uh, what we want, we want to 
see all of the cognition with the DDM and evidence accumulation. And we want to interpret all of uh, cognition with the evidence accumulation and DDM. Uh, that is not a naive uh, and simple uh, paradigm to, to interpret all of cognition. Mm. So clearly, um, it's too simple for where you may have multiple decisions, uh, multiple implicit decisions, uh, determining the final observed decision. All right. So I'm not saying that you couldn't then stack up these deciders to do that, but I think then you start wanting to go away from a simple parallel race, which is tremendously tractable, towards something where you have the convolution of a set of choices or switches or something like that. Now that you need that sort of stacking to get to the full general computational power that race models would have. I'm not saying that a, that a simple parallel rate, although actually I think formally you can unwind things like that. So yes, I, I do think that uh, this idea of, uh, 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 or, or at least we, we would have to consider multi-step procedures. Now, of course, you know, it, there's no guarantee that this is enough. I mean, there are people who, you know, if you, you're Paul Sissick or someone like that, you say, well, it's not about evidence accumulation, right? There's this just general urgency accumulation go going on or this, this, this urge to respond and it's got nothing to do with evidence. So you might say, well, evidence isn't everything. And of course, the timed racing diffusion, really that timing accumulator is, it's not accumulating evidence, right? It's accumulating a constant signal effectively that's just measuring time. And so, no, that's, that's, that's different. That's not evidence accumulation so much. Whether and how far we can get with this formal framework of races, I guess what I argued that is that we could probably get a very long way, but I, I'm, it, it may in some sense be slightly empty to say it's a race model because that really is just saying it's a general computational device that can do lots of stuff. The devil to me is in the detail of how do you put that together? How does it explain, how does it compute the functions that, that you know, that humans need to compute in order to do things? And, you know, is, is the model fitting the way that people do stuff? Does that, does that answer your question or I missed the question? I wasn't quite oh, sure. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your explanation. Uh, however, I, I have a general concern in the, our community. Uh, for example, you said uh, about uh, uh, X Gaussian to mm. interpret a stop signal uh, by Dora, I think, and region maker. And uh, when I uh, review uh, this kind of uh, paper, they, uh, they just talk about the model fitting and how to generate uh, some accuracy and reaction down to the best interpret uh, observation data. And mm. when they talk about the uh, interpretation, they stop and they talk about, oh, uh, we can interpret uh, each of um, each of uh, variable and parameter in X Gaussian. Mm. Uh, I, I need uh, your, uh, your suggestion. Uh, if uh, when we want to propose and create a new model, we need to talk, uh, we need to think about interpretation or not we just oh yeah no 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 that's a model the, fitting that no that's the distinctive and key difference for cognitive modeling the parameters are meaningful um that gives you a tremendous amount of constraint that you just don't have in statistical descriptions right so you can you can you can fit the model and it can give you um uh estimates which are just not sensible and then when i see them i say this model is not good i don't care if it fits well it's meaningless, right? Now, specifically with the X Gaussian and using it in the, the race model there, in, the, in, the, in what we, we called this actually a hybrid model. So the idea was that we had this process plausible accumulation for the choice, but unfortunately the maths of reality and, 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 and what you can measure in this paradigm means we just can't use that for the stop, but it's still process plausible in that it's a race. I think what we did was we truncated the X Gaussian at 50 milliseconds or something like that. So it can never be negative, which is of course a, a bit of a problem if time's negative uh, for something to happen. And then what it does give you is it still gives you the, 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 the time uh, and the variability of, this, the, 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 um, of the inhibitory horse, right? So you still get a meaningful quantity. It's just not 
it's not mu or tau or sigma. It's something like, well, it's not quite mu plus tau because it was truncated, but you know what I mean? You get the mean of that distribution. And that then is a meaningful quantity that you could interpret and compare between say groups or manipulations. Does that make sense? So, so it doesn't have to be that the parameters, so that being, and that, in that sense it was a hybrid, right? It was a hybrid between this thing that was clearly descriptive for the stop runner, but we were forced to that. And uh, the race model, which does have a good process interpretation. And the other big thing about that was if you just use the old, the beast model, Dora's beast model, the X, all X Gaussians, the parameters just blow up because you know, you, you can't constrain that if you have a complex choice task. So that paper that I archive, it's like archive I pointed to has a really complicated choice task. We'd need about 50 parameters to describe the choice thing because there are all these manipulations. Now, when I did it with the evidence accumulation with racing worlds on that side, I got down to around 20 because I could say, well, thresholds can't vary over this and rates can only vary with that. That semantics is key, right? That semantics of saying, no, if, you're, if you really are going to interpret this, You've got to, the parameters have got to be constrained. I think that's really, really key and distinctive for that cognitive model. So that's an excellent question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I have uh, another question if I have time. Uh, uh, up to, if there's any, no one else, yeah, of course, go ahead. Uh, uh, my question is that uh, about the race model, uh, I have uh, some challenges uh, about the uh, uh, interpretation of race model. Uh, as you know, uh, there are a lot of uh, no, uh, papers who talk about neural mechanism of DDM uh, supported by Sheldon, Yosam, or also Kiani. And they try to talk about how, uh, uh, how our brain uh, accumulated uh, information to make decisions, for example, uh, LIP and... Uh, yep, yep, yep. Yeah. And uh, my question is that how brain to uh, interpret each, uh, uh, each accumulation of race models. We think that we have uh, some independent area that accumulation independently uh, to make decision. That is a little bit impossible for me to so think I about. I mean, I mean, I'm not a neuroscientist, but let me give you my ill-informed opinion, which is I think it's crazy to think that these models describe anything like that this particular little area. I think I see they're describing an emergent property. I think the threshold process is happening somewhere down in striatum. I think, you know, look, I think this is distributed across the brain. I'm not much of a localist. I like network models of brain things. And I think that what we're describing here is an emergent property. I think it's very problematic that you, the, the, I think the monkey work for me is very problematic. I've not, uh, you know, the, the, I, if you actually, I don't know if you've ever got monkey data and played with it, but it's heavily non-stationary, right? It's just nothing like as simple as the models that are being, you know, the monkeys are going up and down between sessions. There's all sorts of, the, 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 there's, a, there's a paper I didn't um, cite it here, but that I have with Pete Cassie and Scott Brown where we fit some of Shale's data and, they made these claims that, you know, the LBA couldn't fit and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, fair enough, it didn't fit their day. When we looked, they'd done a speed accuracy trade-off and they just had naughty monkeys. They had monkeys when, when monkeys don't like going slow. So in the accuracy emphasis condition, they just had a mixture of occasionally going fast. And you could literally see the bump. They didn't look at the distributions. You could literally see a fast bump and a slow bump. And when you lined up the fast and the slow conditions, in the fast condition, the little bump in the slow condition, the, the accuracy condition, they lined up. And we fit a model where we could just say, right, they have a fast and a slow mode and off you go, right? So I am quite cautious about that data. I, I think they're looking under the, you know, I mean, you know, shout, on the, shout at me for this, but they're looking under the spotlight a bit. You can measure this, you can stick this electrode in and look at this area and then you say, that's where it's happening. I really don't believe that. I see it personally as an emergent property and our models describing a higher level. Anyway, I think we've got some other questions here, so I probably should go, but that, that was a great question as well. Thank you. I'm really going to be terrible. I'm going to screw up your pronunciation of your name, but Mer, Merbut? Merbut? Merbut, yeah. Yeah, Merbut. Oh, apologies. <laughs> Hello, and I thank, thank you for you. great presentation. My question on this whole matter is somewhat general, since I'm kind of new to this whole field. Uh, 
In all the models uh, we've uh, gotten to know to so far in the workshop, and also the models uh, you have explained to us in your presentation, uh, the effect of uh, you know human emotions uh, are kind of uh, not accounted for, I think. Uh, so say you uh, want to study making decisions under emotional stress, under risk, or under threats. Uh, how uh, uh, my question is: Can we use these models you've explained uh, so far, or we should kind of evolve them? or change them to be able to uh, be suitable for those tasks? Oh, good question. So I think the models are quite neutral to that question and they have already been used quite a lot to deal with um, high pressure decision-making. Certainly I've got a whole stream of research where we've looked at putting people, I, I think I cited that somewhere in the, the, the perspective memory stuff about um, uh, decision-making in the red zone. So we already pushed people into high pressure decision-making situations. And, you know, you can express that in terms of where you set your thresholds and the, the level of variability and rates and things like that. Um, Corey White has a bunch of nice work, uh, one of Roger's um, former students, uh, looking at uh, clinical applications. Um, I've applied the LBA to um, schizophrenia, uh, people with schizophrenia, and looking at the way that that. Um, Alex Vigard also has some excellent work looking at um, ADHD. Um, so, in fact, I think that they're, they're kind of neutral uh, with respect to this. I, it, you know, I think what you're seeing is that many of the paradigms you've seen so far have been these well-controlled um, experimental paradigms with undergraduates, right? But that's, that's a, not a necessary limitation at all. Yeah, you, exactly. You, exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure who's next. Is it Zahara or Amir? I'm not sure who. Zahara. Zara. Yeah, Zahra, hi. Um, first of all, thank you for the great presentation. It was very much useful for me and I'm sure for everyone else. Um, my question is also a bit more general. Um, you explained the, um, uh, like the threshold count models, like the ones uh, which was either circ circular or quadrical or, li or linear and, but, I did understood the whole thing and it was very much interesting, but what I can't quite understand is what would happen with this approach if we're going beyond binary choices? Uh, right, so, so the, it, 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 it is going beyond, but all of those little colored segments I was showing you, they're different choices. So um, like there, this is that, that's, that's a choice, that's a different choice, that's a different choice in there, that's a different choice, right? Every, that, that's a different choice from that. Right, so these are multiple choices or up here. And so in the MTR, this would be a representation of, say, three levels of confidence. You would decide either left or right with high, medium and low confidence, low, medium, high. Same for the threshold count here. All right. Here, the quadratic spacing changes the nature of how the decisions um, will be distributed, but it's the same six decisions. And here... We've just got a lot of thresholds. And so now we've got, I think they do 25 different decisions. And then this one, if you imagine taking these number of thresholds to infinity and then effectively you're just deciding on this, you know, you just look at the states and decide when, when, when this equation is satisfied, it's um, is greater than C, then essentially you've got fully continuous responding. Does that, does that make, make sense? Um, yeah, yeah, I just, I guess I just mixed it up, but because it was, because like the X linear was the right evidence total and the uh, yeah, yeah. Y linear was the left. So I just like that. Mixed yeah, it up. yeah, yeah, no, 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 but it, no, fair enough. Probably my poor explanation as well. So apologies. No, no, no. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, Amir, I think you're up. Uh, thank you. Uh, my second question is that, uh, how we can uh, actually, how we can extend uh, the uh, time-based race diffusion model for the value-based decision-making. Uh, because when uh, we are working with both uh, magnitude effect and difference effect uh, in the evidence uh, 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 part, and uh, uh, the magnitude effect can cause uh, some, uh, uh, 
uh, fast response uh, error when uh, uh, when uh, uh, in, in the case that uh, two options uh, has high values but uh, they are close to each other. Uh, but in this case, we have uh, some sort of low uh, uh, response error. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, we uh, we can uh, we can uh, if we can uh, uh, modulate the uh, time uh, the the time derivative rate the timing derivative rate. Uh, can we uh, do this or uh, do that or not? So. Identifiability-wise, you can't really tell sort of rate and threshold apart very well. I mean, all you kind of get is that there's it finishes in a certain time, and you could fix. You could say, right, my rate is fixed at one. I have this constant sense of the flow of time. It's probably not true, right? You know, it does we know time varies? Uh, but then I set my threshold depending on the contingencies of this particular thing. I'm going to lower it because I really need to make my decision and move on, or I'll put it higher because I've got the time. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't think you could independently identify those two possibilities. Uh, you would need some other source of constraint or some assumption or something like that. Um, in terms of value-based decision-making, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what, yeah, I, 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 I'd have to think about it, but I, I don't think it's conceptually different to the perceptual side of things. Seems to me, Time is kind of an orthogonal thing. So you've got evidence of various sorts. To be honest, this is something I'd like to do some research on and I'm thinking of doing because I think there's a range of, you know, perceptual decisions, value-based decisions, factual decisions, all those sorts of things. Um, where does time come into all of those? Um, you know, and, uh, um, but that model does have identification issues. Uh, if you notice the, the fine detail, we fixed the non-decision time uh, there, right? So, uh, and it's a bit of a version of the identifiability issues that happen with the stop signal model because you, you, you get this guess, right? And you don't directly identify that it, that's a guess, right? It's just, you know, you get it, at least you get an RT, but it's, it's in a mixture. And so it can be hard to pull out. And so we, we did some sensitivity and analysis around that. Um, so yeah, uh, I think there are some challenges there. Maybe the, the approach has to be measuring individual differences of time estimation in some other task, uh, you know, in repeated measures design, where you measure the individuals in the way that they, they time uh, and, and you get some measure there. And then you then link that to making decisions on other dimensions and try to put those two together. Thank you for, for your uh, complete answer. Thank you. No worries. Right. I think. Yeah, Hassan. Hassan, hey. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a, a question about the general procedure of the research in the field. Uh, it seems that uh, every year some new models are being introduced, uh, as you introduced some of them. Uh, and uh, it seems that we are approaching a point where uh, we have uh, so many models that any of them are uh, are performing equally good in the experimental data, and uh, they may have, uh, but they may have different values for, uh, say, meaning parameters, and uh, uh, we have uh, we are in a place that we cannot uh, choose between models, we cannot decide which model is better. And uh, yeah, I think we are approaching that point. Uh, is it right? And uh, is, there, is there a, a way to uh, decide between model, choose between yeah. models? And yeah, my question is that. Thank you. Um, I have some sympathy for this from my background in physics where there were some pretty well figured out models and, and that was what we played with. Um, I don't think we're anywhere near there in psychology. I see these as tools that can um, uh, provide us with ways to get at these latent quantities that have some process plausibility, but are models, all right? And so they have those limitations. I um, am personally really very suspect about anyone who says this is the right model because it seems to then play into the idea that there is 
uh, that it's not a model anymore. It's reality, right? It's not some abstraction. So th now th th there's definitely a matter of personal taste here. Some people, they hate this idea. They want, well, I want the truth. Now, given I've got the truth, I'm going to now march forward and use the truth. Um, my feeling is maybe psychology is not for you then if you think it's going to work that way. Um, but, but I do, uh, and, and you could, but I guess you could almost guess that from my presentation, right? It was really that here's a flexible modeling framework. I, look, I frequently fit the DDM and the LBA uh, or, or a bunch of different models. And I mean, formally, if you want to think of it, you've got model uncertainty. Um, sometimes if, all of the models point in the same direction. I think you could start thinking, yeah, I think this is a, you know, I can, my inference can be more certain than if they said different things. If they say different things, then you need to look into it to think about, well, why are they different? And is there some way I can differentiate between them? Um, but no, you're right. There's a, and, and I think we can only expect this proliferation to continue because our computational power is greater. So, you know, we've been limited our imaginations have been limited somewhat by being able to get things analytic, um, you know, and that's that's dropping away. Um, I do think that there's a balance between it's got to describe things, but it's also got to be meaningful. I'm not a big believer in using optimality or rationality as a. I, I think it's a good upper bound guide, but it just doesn't. I think it just so rarely applies to people that you've got to be very careful about that. But it does give you a nice upper bound, um, you know. Uh, I tend to think that there's a whole bunch of converging things that you look at. So whenever I look at an evaluator model, it's not just the DIC is better, right? That's the poor substitute because DIC is usually better for a more complicated model. Are the parameters meaningful? Do they make kind of sense or are they seeing crazy stuff, right? Are they going in the wrong direction for their semantics? Um, you know, there's, there's a bunch of things that I think all together contribute. And unfortunately, it's not a set and forget, leave your brain at the door, right? You've got to really think about what you're doing and you've got to have appropriate uncertainty. Another reason I really like Bayes because I get formal measures of uncertainty as well. Is that any good or is that not really help? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, that was a, a concern I had. Uh, that uh, it seems that these different models uh, have uh, proposed different theoretical assumptions about the procedure of decision making. Mm. And uh, but you see, yeah. there's a unity there, son. Right? I mean, uh, what I was pointing out is that there's, you know, really the difference between a DDM and racing worlds is a, a hypothesis about correlation. Right? It's not. It's not like it's. It's not like completely different. They're not, they're not in different universes at all, all right? You can see this unity and this continuum amongst things. And I think that then gives you a better sense. I mean, certainly everything I've talked about has this idea that you accumulate evidence, except some of it didn't. There was time as well, you know what I mean? Like this. So, so I, I, I think it's worth, and it's hard when you first come to it, to try to see this broader unity and the way in which the models are related and to not take this very black and white view that it's this or that. So that was kind of the point of my talk today was to try and get you to think a bit like that. And it can be quite bewildering when you first start because there's all these formal models and great deal of detail and every one of them is a little universe unto itself. Now, I'm sure other speakers will have different views to this. So you'll be exposed to people who believe differently. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, but uh, uh, on the other hand, the, the, there may be a small correlation between the parameters that each of these models. It's a continuum, right? I mean, you could say that they can sit anywhere from completely independent to completely negatively dependent or positively. You know, right? So maybe then you think, well, the model I want is the one that can estimate that correlation. A word of warning there. All right. You, you can't identify those correlations uh, just in a straight um, uh, choice model. So this is something in that JMS psych paper about the correlated uh, log normal races. Um, you just cannot identify a correlation because it's kind of like, if you want to think about what you're doing when you're measuring a correlation, it's kind of something about the relationship between the winner and the loser. But if you only ever see the winner, <laughs> you're screwed, right? Uh, but if you get confidence ratings, it turns out you can identify and you can measure the correlations because at least if you believe the modeling framework, then 
uh, the confidence is telling you something about the loser. So now, you know, if you're going to correlate X and Y, you've got to know something about X and Y, <laughs> right? So, so the, the, this is another lesson about practical limitations. Sometimes we just can't get what we want. And it's a common mistake when you first come into the field, have a brilliant idea and go, all right, I can, you know, this must be what it is for whatever reason you believe what it is. You've got some background reason. There's really the practical, you know, is that going to be useful? Can you actually test it against data? That's a really important, so is it identifiable? Um, all of those things have to limit your theoretical imagination a little bit, maybe less so being able to do the math now, but the identifiability one is still gonna be a problem for you. Yeah, thank you so much. No worries. All right, have we got anyone else left? I have one, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, hi again. Uh, how can we use uh, these models in uh, cases where exists uh, time gaps in the evidence accumulation stage and uh, say quite large time gaps, for example, hours or I don't know, days, time, large time gaps like these? So you, you're going to immediately have a problem with getting enough observations there, right? Um, if you, if, if, if you're, every observation takes a couple of days to get, because of this time gap, then that's going to be problematic. Otherwise, uh, it's an example of uh, not observing, I guess, something unobserved, and it's another potentially something like um, non-stationarity, right? So that that um, uh, um, like that LBA where the evidence changed, right? So you've got the, you've got this idea that the, the, there's there's this change within the accumulation of the period where the decision is being made. Um, so I think conceptually, you could imagine models that could do that, how you would practically get the data and uh, how identifiable any of that would be is another matter. Um, but, you know, it's, it's one, one wonderful thing is we've got computers now, right? You can simulate these models. You can simulate what is a reasonable process model for this that you think you know, you've got some good semantics for. And then you can look at it and say, ah, it makes these two different ways of doing it make different predictions in this way. So you may not be able to fit it to the data, but you may be able to find discriminating uh, uh, measures that you might, and that, that might then move you ahead. So that's something that it's important to understand identifiability is not the characteristic of a model alone. It's a characteristic of the combination of the model and the design in which it's being used. Okay. And so, and, and your ability to find discrimination between models doesn't always necessarily require identifiability of parameters. Sometimes you can just, there's some nice work with um, Nate Evans and Jennifer Trueblood and Bill um, Holmes, where they compared a bunch of models of context effects. So we had a model called the MLBA. I didn't talk about it. Um, and it's, you know, not that great at it being identified and neither was anyone else's model. But you could fit them all to data and go, look, some of them just don't fit, right? They just don't, you know, and, and that, that's, that tells you something, right? That's a model selection sort of way of making inference, even if the parameters aren't going to. So you do have some options like that. Thank you so much. Okay. okay. Yeah, Andrew, many thank you again for everything. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, now I think we can finish the meeting. Okay. All right. Good stuff. I enjoyed it very much. Um, good luck for the rest of your workshop. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Okay. Have a nice day. Cheers, everyone. Bye.